Bookworm Games, Episode 11, Best Friend. Welcome back, one and all. This is Wesley Schantz. And sometimes, in trying to say too many things in these episodes, I worry I don't say any of them as clearly as I would like to. And for this unspeakable error, I do beg your pardon. And I would like to thank my long-suffering classes this week, some of my old students from Arizona who may have found some of my work online and and certainly put up with all my long stories and long silences in class. It's that time of year again when another round of them are graduating from high school or even college at this point and at least moving up a grade, making summer plans, which I hope will include lots of reading and maybe even playing some Earthbound. I hope you all are well this fine spring day. But we're turning now to Winters, a small country in the north, where snow carpets the forest ridges and frost coats the windows. Gruff goats frisk and Tessie watchers watch Lake Tess. A dungeon maker toils in obscurity and Stonehenge looms over a famed scientist's lab with a sanctuary spot only steps away, yet utterly inaccessible, without the buoyancy, oh sorry, I can't read my handwriting, the buoyancy of bubblegum and the lake monster's friendship. Now fortunately, a faithful following monkey will secure you both of those things, bobbing up to drop down a rope and to steer the dinosaur in the lake. And that's where I think we should begin, with that monkey, and with that hint provided by the gift shop just over the iron wrought fence, which is called Best Friend. And in that crucial moment of leaping over the gate and leaving Snowwood Boarding School, thanks to your best friend, Tony giving you a boost, and then Tony goes back inside. In that moment that Jeff, or whatever name you gave him back at the start of your game file, in that moment that he jumps the fence, there's this sort of bewildering uh, dawning of freedom and of finality. You can't go back into the boarding school, ever. An unknown expanse of snow-covered, England-like place stretches before you, and all you know is that you're heading south, following the call of a friend you've never met, leaving the friend you have. When those words heard in a dream woke Jeff up, Tony was awoken, too, from a dream of taking a walk with Jeff. His mixture of sentiment and then stiff upper lip, he says he'd understand that you have to go and I'll help you any way he can. This mixture is touching, and it has suggested to many players a romantic attraction. And this is supported by some of the quotes that we have from Itoi. And the portrayal of a gay character in a video game has been a great solace to a lot of people who are figuring out their own identity, no doubt. It's also very touching the way that Tony warns you to be careful about leaving the dorm room at night, only when you go outside into the hall to find a group of boys out there chatting casually. And then you go next door and those kids are up and awake in their room and wrapping presents. And then you go downstairs and they're one of the teachers or maybe a sister older student who has some more responsibility, Maxwell, in his lab. Far from sending you back to bed, he actively helps you prepare for your journey and set out. So rule-breaking, it turns out, may not be so catastrophic. And that's a good message to hear, but I don't advocate rule-breaking. Far be it. Now, when you go through Maxwell's lab and he gives you the key and The key's a little bent, and you can't open the lockers with the bent key. By the time you come back into his lab, he's fashioned you a bad key machine on the spot. And he reminds you that this kind of thing is a skill that you too possess, to take damaged or unassuming objects and apply your ingenuity to repair or modify them for use. And he also remarks about your father, the famous scientist Dr. Ann Donuts. So Jeff is the only character in the game, who we're sure has got a last name. So it's Jeff and Donuts. (laughs) Between this and that dorm room next door, 
where in all likelihood he barged in and automatically started opening a number of the presents that are scattered around before realizing that they were specially wrapped for some kind of party. Um, these acts of daring helped to solidify Jeff's character as even a little reckless or oblivious to the consequences of what he's doing. And at the same time, showing that he's practical, able to fix things and handy, but also highly idealistic. He's following a call that he heard in a dream. He doesn't just stay up through the night to fix things. He stays up hearing these voices of friends he's never met. And for some hint of an explanation for this combination of personality traits, uh, we're given, too, this information to, about a um, brilliant yet, as we'll see, a standoffish father and no mother in sight. So in this way, Jeff is a kind of reflection of Ness. Now, along with his whole aesthetic, which is a kind of geek, schoolboy, James Bond thing, uh, plus his personality, um, it seems like Tony's puppy love for Jeff makes sense. And whether Tony feels any jealousy or resentment at being left behind or or not, his fast affection, his abiding friendship, clearly overcomes any negative emotions as he physically lifts Jeff over the boundary to set him on his adventure. Yet, Tony bids Jeff always remember that they're best friends. So, there's a certain mixture of irony and slapstick, then, that the shop just outside the wall is called best friend, apparently, and they quickly push into your possession there the bubble monkey, along with the gum that's on clearance. And the bubble monkey is called that because he lightly floats over obstacles when he chews a piece of the gum from that apparently bottomless pack. So this too, elation and lightness, an easy come and easy go kind of thing, can be the way that friendship feels, along with those other ways, that mysterious voice in the night, that person who's always there, that somebody who's helping his friend set out on life's adventures, even if it means that your paths should diverge. But there's still that bond that lives in the memory. All of this seems as part of friendship. And I think it's no accident, then, that this theme is so strongly emphasized at this part of the game where you also have these mysteries thrown together which lend depth to your adventure. You immediately come upon Lake Tess and then shortly after on Stonehenge. And there's so many lonely characters introduced, I think, to lend contrast as well. So you have Maxwell and Brick Road Dr. Ann Donuts, and even Jeff and Tony, now that they're apart. So Jeff, in traveling through these mysteries, going from one friend who helps him to two others who need his help, going from the bright, shiny, frosty Snowwood boarding school, where everything is safe and cozy and friendly, into a town of darkness and despair, and all the while meeting these lone characters along the way and touching their lives, I think that Jeff's journey here offers a way to think about the trade-offs between solitude and companionship and the mysteries that are there in both. So, on the one hand, his journey suggests that great works and wonders can be accomplished all on one's own. Uh, well, I guess not counting the bubble monkey who's following you. Um, at least Tessie is unique, seemingly. Stonehenge is certainly unique. Of course, there's also the Stonehenge in our world. But anyway, Dr. And Donuts is in isolation. He's created an instant revitalizing device that replaces a good night's sleep. And he's made a sky runner, a kind of low-flying UFO that can home in on Paula's psychic beacon. And though... Brick Road has built an adorable little dungeon by the side of Lake Tess. He does realize that he'll need Dr. Andonut's help to become Dungeon Man. 
about which more, another time when we meet him again. And then Dr. And Donuts himself will need help from a mysterious source to complete his phase distorter and fulfill the dream to move freely through space and time. So, thus it seems that for the greatest works of self-transformation and conceptual or actual breakthroughs, friendship and fellowship are indispensable. To save your game, of course, you do call Maxwell. And then, as we've said, to progress, you need the bubble monkey's lightness. So they're among the Tessie Watchers tents, those fans brought together by their shared love and pursuit of the mystery. In the morning, when the wind begins to blow, dead leaves from last autumn, it seems, or maybe just the next country over, for in winters all is evergreen trees. Then, when you step onto a conspicuous spot where the land tapers to the lake, the bubble monkey takes flight, and a smiling dinosaur rises to meet him. And so the bubble monkey perches there on his head, and you climb on the back of the dinosaur, like Mario in that underwater lake level in Mario 64. You ride along, and the sleigh bells and woodwinds drop away for a majestic horn melody that provides your water music. Once across Lake Tess, again, there's no going back. Though, some of those souvenirs for sale at the Best Friend Shop might have hinted that you will be back at some point, as well as that sanctuary spot waiting in the cave. That should give it away, because Jeff by himself is not permitted to challenge its guardian. Now, in Brick Road's little dungeon, with all his billboards scattered around, and uh, beware of falling objects. So the Mad Ducks help draw attention to Jeff's lack of PP, psychic points, and their attempt, their attacks attempt to deplete it or block the use of it. And good for them, but you don't need it. Now similarly, in there you get the chance, I think, because of the apparent harmlessness of the worthless protoplasms, you can uh, go ahead and try out Jeff's spy command, which is unique to him. Um, and you may find that some of the enemies have weak spots or are hiding a present behind them. Now, whatever you do, just don't use that big bottle rocket in Jeff's inventory until you're in dire need. The ruler and the protractor, of course, once you're done with any math homework, you can safely get rid of those and free up room for more baked goods dropped by enemies and found in gift boxes. Now, not only is there a reprise of the pencil-shaped iron statue that was last seen blocking your way through Peaceful Rest Valley, but if you check out a similar conspicuous patch of ground that's in the middle of Stonehenge, and you have to dodge the lumbering cave boys to get there, you'll find a scary glowing path blocked by an eraser statue. And lucky for you that it is, because the enemies down there, you'll soon find, are well beyond your current ability to handle. Now, are we to understand that Dungeon Man is responsible for setting up these mysterious statues? Are we supposed to be thinking about how writing implements kind of block your way, a kind of a writer's block pun here? I'm not sure. Anyway, by now, the Bubble Monkey has uh, moved on. He's followed a female of the species off into the snowy trees where you can't follow. And you're on your own, but only briefly. Uh, for one thing, there's a beefy gentleman hanging out by Stonehenge who insists that you kids don't look very bright. Well, he's only one of you at the moment, but anyhow, he insists that it is the Stonehenge, he says. And this is curious, since the Tessie watchers were just as clear in their enunciation that Lake Tess is different from Loch Ness, and their beloved Tessie is different from the monster who happens to share the name of the hero of this particular adventure. And maybe that's why the change. Anyway, of course, it's perfectly plausible that a significant mystical location like Stonehenge could exist simultaneously in parallel dimensions 
ours and that of the game. As indeed, among some of the explanations that are given for such rings of stones is that they delineate the gateway between worlds. In the very scary almanac, here's how they describe Stonehenge. I know I mentioned this last week, I didn't read about the zombies, but I'll read about Stonehenge here. What makes some places scarier than others? What forces, natural or supernatural, combine to give a patch of land, or a body of water, or an entire country an aura, <laughs> aura of foreboding and terror? Is there really something there? Something unseen, yet somehow sensed? Read on and decide for yourself. Stonehenge. A circle of huge stone slabs on Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, England. Stonehenge dates from before written history. Stonehenge means hanging stones. No one knows who put them there or why. Some say Merlin, King Arthur's magician, built Stonehenge during the Middle Ages. Others say it may have been used as a landing site for UFOs. Many people claim that the stones possess magical powers, and many report seeing strange lights and unexplainable sounds around the stones. Modern-day witches and pagans come to Stonehenge for their major festivals. And then there's a great picture there. So, again, Very Scary Almanac by Eric Elfman, illustrated by Will Succo. Um, man, I loved this book as a kid. I still love this book. Obviously, I still have it, so... Um, and as it points out in there, a few pages later here, uh, there are numerous other Tessie-like monsters in bodies of water the world over. So there's a list here. In uh, White River near Newport, Arkansas, you've got the White River monster, snake-like creature the size of a railroad car. Lake Payette, Idaho boasts Slimy Slim, 50-foot-long reptilian creature. Churubusco, Indiana has the Beast of Busco, giant snapping turtle. Lake Champlain at the northern border of New York State has Champ, 20-foot long water snake with a horse-like head. At Willowa Lake, Oregon, you've got the Willowa Lake monster, a huge black snake-like creature. And Stufion has also got a song about that. And then in Chesapeake Bay, Virginia, near my home, near the mouth of the Potomac River, is Chessie, gray snake-like thing about 25 feet long. But here's the Loch Ness monster affectionately known as Nessie. What? A long reptilian creature with a snake-like head. The skin appears to be dark gray and smooth. Some suspect that the creature is a pleosaur, plesiosaur, sorry, which most scientists believe became ex extinct 70 million years ago. Where? Loch Ness, a lake in the highlands of Scotland. First recorded sighting, 8565, when St. Columba saw a huge snake-like thing in Loch Ness and shouted to it, Go back! The creature, oddly enough, obeyed. Modern sightings. On July 22, 1930, three young fishermen saw a creature at least 20 feet long with its head three feet out of the water come rushing toward them, causing their boat to rock. It's unclear whether they had a monkey there with a pack of bubblegum. Then, in 1933, shortly after the construction of a new road around the lake, a man driving on the road claimed he saw a 30-foot-long creature. He watched it frolic for about a minute before it plunged under the surface. Verdict of Science. In 1960, the first film was taken of the monster, and it showed a dark shape swimming rapidly. Critics scoffed, saying the object could have been a boat or a log. Then, England's Royal Air Force analyzed the film. The RAF said that without question, the object in the film was alive and could have been up to 90 feet long. In 1970, the American Academy of Applied Science brought in underwater cameras that would take a picture automatically if an object came within range. It wasn't long before they got results. One 1972 photo clearly showed a pair of large flippers. Another may have shown a face, but the image was too fuzzy to be certain. Is there really a monster in Loch Ness? Why is it so hard to get an answer? One reason that it has been so difficult to prove the creature's existence is the size of Loch Ness. It's 24 miles long and a mile and a half wide at its widest point, making it the largest lake in the British Isles. It has an average depth of 450 feet, dropping to 900 feet in some places. The water is also very murky, making it difficult to take useful underwater photos. There are also dangerous currents in the loch, making an underwater search very risky. Now, there's also Mokole Membembe, a giant reptile with a long neck, about the size of an elephant, in the Lakualala 
swamp region of the Congo in Central Africa. And then, of course, you have Kraken, the giant octopus, about which more another time. Now, where were we here? Um, now, I've been, uh, I've been skimming through the uh, Humble bum Bundle, sorry, uh, my friend Ryan had recommended to me recently. Practically every one of those authors that came in that MIT Game Studies Humble Bundle likes to cite this work by a, an author called uh, Huizinga, the title of it Homo Ludens. Um, and they always like to talk about this magic circle around the game. And, uh, and so maybe that's a way to understand Stonehenge here too, as an image of mysteries which can be bounded and circumscribed. Whereas Tessie and Loch Tess, Lake Tess, would in turn represent those which are flowing and deep like water and moving and uh, unexpected like the wind and like the music which uh, represents motion in time and space which may be experienced but it's not really at one's choosing. For even with the music, you know, the same song played at different moments may not have the same effect on you. Now, I'm going to have to find that article or book or whatever it is and give that a read at some point. But for this week, I think I think we want to turn to Montaigne again, right? I tried to talk about his apology for Raymond Sibon um, uh, one of these weeks because that's where that playful cat quote appears. Um, but this time, I will take the liberty of reading a bit from one of the essays that I have actually read, and uh, one that I read with some classes before. And it's one of the first ones that I remember really liking, and one that I've been sent back to repeatedly um, when it comes up in other authors, such as Jacques Barzun, the cultural historian, who prizes it so highly. And the essay, of course, is on friendship. So... It begins. As I was observing the way in which a painter in my employment goes about his work, I felt tempted to imitate him. He chooses the best spot in the middle of each wall as the place for a picture, which he elaborates with all his skill, and the empty space all round he fills with grotesques, which are fantastic paintings, with no other charm than their variety and strangeness. And what are these things of mine, indeed? but grotesques and monstrous bodies pieced together from sundry limbs with no definite shape and with no order, sequence, or proportion except by chance. He's speaking, of course, of his essays, and he gives in one of his quotes here. Desinit in piscem mulier formosa superna, a beautiful woman that tails off into a fish. Horace, Ars Poetica 4. I am at one with my painter in this second point, but I fall short of him in the other and better part, for my skill is not such that I dare undertake a fine finished picture that follows the rules of art. It has occurred to me, therefore, to borrow one from Etienne de la Boétie, which will grace all the rest of this work. It is a treatise to which he gave the name The Voluntary Servitude, but others who did not know this have since very fitly renamed it The Protest. There's a footnote here. Montaigne would have included this work in his essays, if the Protestants had not printed it under this title in a collection of pamphlets published in 1576. So, Boti wrote this as an essay in his early youth in praise of liberty and against tyrants. It has for a long time been circulating among men of understanding, not without singular and well-deserved commendation, for it, has fi it is as fine and perfect as it could be. Yet it is far short of the best that he could do. And if in his maturer years when I knew him, he had conceived a plan, like this of mine, of committing his thoughts to writing, we should now see many rare things, which would make our age almost as famous as antiquity. For in natural gifts particularly, I know of no one who could compare with him. But he left behind him nothing except this treatise, and this only by chance, as I believe he never saw it after it left his hands and some observations on that January edict, famous in our civil wars, which will perhaps yet find a place elsewhere. So that is the edict of January 1571, which granted the Huguenots the freedom of public worship. Now, 
That is all that I have been able to recover from his possessions, except a little book of his works, which I have already published. To me he bequeathed in a will made when he was in the very grip of death, his library and his papers, with a most loving message, and I owe, per I owe a particular debt to this treatise, because it was the means of our first acquaintance. For it was shown me a long time before I met him, and gave me my first knowledge of his name, thus preparing the way for that friendship, which we preserved as long as God willed, a friendship so complete and perfect, that its like has seldom been read of, and nothing comparable is to be seen among the men of our day. So many circumstances are needed to build it up, that it is something if fate achieves it once in three centuries. So, in, uh, in that passage we get a sense of Montaigne's typical sort of self-effacing mixture of uh, of all of all that he observes and uh, despair at his own inability to express it um, he refers there to the library uh, so he get, he gets that from his friend in his will um, that library which gave him so much solace in his retirement and uh, and such inexhaustible funds of quotations from classical authors and fodder for reflections in his own writing. Um, he goes on, so let me read the next paragraph and then say a few more things. So he says, There is nothing for which nature seems to have given us such a bent as for society. And Aristotle says that good lawgivers have paid more attention to friendship than to justice. Of a perfect society, friendship is the peak. For, generally speaking, all those relationships that are created and fostered by pleasure and profit, by public or private interest, are so much the less fine and noble, and so much the less friendships, insofar as they mix some cause or aim or advantage with friendship, other than friendship itself. Nor do the four kinds recognized by the ancients, natural, social, hospitable, and sexual, separately or in combination, come up to it. So, what Montaigne is calling friendship here is something that is special, uh, not like what he reads about in books, not like anything else he's seen, and he claims it won't happen again for another three centuries. Uh, so I guess we're about due for one. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the next several pages comprise his reflections on other kinds of important relationships, um, such as between children and parents, or between brothers, he also touches upon sexual love and marriage, and even homosexuality. And it winds up here. Um, he says, therefore, the ancients call it, that is, homosexual love, sacred and divine. And to their thinking, only the violence of tyrants and the baseness of the people are opposed to it. In brief, all that can be said in favor of the Academy's conception is that it is a love which terminates in friendship, a definition which does not disagree with that of the Stoics. Quote, that love is an attempt to gain the friendship of someone whose beauty has attracted us. Cited in Cicero, Tusculan, Disputations 4, 34. Uh, I return, he says, this is Montaigne again, uh, to my description of a more right and proper kind of friendship. He quotes again, Cicero de Amicitia 20 goes, In general, you cannot judge a relationship until the partners have attained strength and stability in mind and in years. End quote. For the rest, what we commonly call friends and friendships are no more than acquaintanceships and familiarities, contracted either by chance or for advantage, which have brought our minds together. In the friendship I speak of, they mix and blend into the other in so perfect a union that the seam which has joined them is effaced and disappears. If I were pressed to say why I love him, I feel that my only reply could be, because it was he, because it was I. So there's that celebrated line. And if it sounds at first like it's not a reason at all, it should. That seems to be the point. And here's the last bit that I'll read. He goes on, there is, beyond all my reasoning, and beyond all that I can specifically say, some inexplicable power of destiny that brought about our union. We were looking for each other before we met, by reason of the reports we had heard of, of each other, which made a greater impression on our emotions than mere reports reasonably should. 
I believe that this was brought about by some decree of heaven. We embraced one another by name. And at our first meeting, which happened by chance at a great feast and gathering in the city, we found ourselves so captivated, so familiar, so bound to one another, that from that time nothing was closer to either than each was to the other. He wrote an excellent Latin satire, which has been published, in which he excuses and explains the suddenness of our understanding, which so quickly grew to perfection. Having so short a time to live, and having begun so late, for we were both grown men, and he some years the elder, it had no time to lose, and none in which to conform to the regular pattern of those mild friendships that require so many precautions in the form of long preliminary intercourse. Such a friendship has no model but itself, and can only be compared to itself. It was not one special consideration, nor two, nor three, nor four, nor a thousand. It was some mysterious quintessence of all this mixture, which possessed itself of my will, and led it to plunge and lose itself in his, which possessed itself of his whole will, and led it, with a similar hunger and a like impulse, to plunge and lose itself in mine. I may truly say lose, for it left us with nothing that was our own, nothing that was either his or mine. So, very passionate explanation there, or explanation for why he can't give an explanation for his friendship with Etienne de la Bauti. Um Sorry, let me find my place. Uh, with that fusion of wills that's mutually lost in one another, we might recall Montaigne's point earlier, his point of departure for the essay, which was going to be that this essay was going to comprise a kind of Fanciful, grotesque. Remember the comparison to the painter. His essay is going to be that fanciful kind of filling in the space around. And around what? Around the perfect centerpiece, which is to be that work of Etienne Laboiti, called Voluntary Servitude, also later called The Protest. Um, so this treatise seems to represent an alternative to those social contract theorists like Locke and Hobbes and Rousseau, who were so influential for the American founding and the French Revolution and subsequent sort of Western liberal politics. Instead, La Bauti seems to argue for submission to the monarch. Uh, unless, of course, as Montaigne points out, that monarch turns to be a tyrant. In the language of will that is used here too, this mutual interpenetration of wills. Uh, I'm tempted to recall another important connection besides Aristotle's between friendship and government, but instead to friendship and religion. So I don't think Montaigne makes this point in the essay, but it calls to mind some of that Christian language of which he is at times so skeptical. For example, here I've got John's Gospel the account of the Last Supper. Um, this is in chapter 15, 11. Here we go. So these things have I spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that you love one another." And then it goes on. I mean, this is pages of red ink here. So we'll stop there. That's John 15, 11 through 17. The verses about the vine and the branches are in there too. And uh, It's just, it's great stuff. Stirring. Uh, but, yeah, highly irrational, um, perhaps. But we do continue to believe, at least in friendship. And it seems like we really want to believe in elements 
of it which are inexplicable, precisely not reducible to any kind of utilitarian or other logical deterministic uh, frame. Um, I'll conclude here with, uh, with the moment when Jeff meets Dr. Ann Donut. So it's a commonplace in a way to have some highly abstract thinker come to grief on the shoals of social interaction. But still, this meeting between Jeff and Dr. Ann Donuts is a bit extreme in the awkwardness that these two uh, brainy uh, father and son uh, show. It's like it's like Jeff's father is trying to be polite. He, he offers you a donut, or rather, he asks if you'd like one, because he would like one, but he doesn't have any. Um, it's like he's trying to save face when, when Jeff sh shows up unexpectedly, and he's just kind of pottering around the lab. Um, he's recently apparently written E equals MC squared on the chalkboard, so he's got some deep thoughts going on. But uh, still, he seems unable to recover from the obvious gulf of distance between himself and his son. He finds a way to remark on some of his recent work, mentioning that phase distorter that's preoccupying him. And then he dismisses Jeff, saying, let's get together in another ten years or so. <laughs> so for all that, it may depend a lot on how you choose to read that, right? What kind of tone of voice you think Dr. Andonet says that final phrase of his in. I prefer it to be a, more of a dreamy tone of voice rather than a cold one. Uh, let's get together again in another ten years or so. Um, I think that's equally in line with what we're given um, and how we can understand his character. He, uh, Maxwell clearly looks up to him. And, uh, and because Dr. Aaron Donuts generously gives Jeff the Skyrunner to use, and it zips you to your destination. So, as you traveled over one mysterious uh, expanse to reach him, now you're sent along on your way over another in the clouds. And the journey alternates between those cloudscapes and then the Skyrunner swooping down over cities and deserts you've never seen. There's a brief glimpse of another monkey. Maybe it's the same one you saw, who knows. Uh, but it's a little like a visual echo of the sort of flashes of insight that we're told Ness gets when he reaches a sanctuary spot. And this is what your dad can give you, this flight, this upbeat music that hurtles along and brings you to your destiny. He'll do his work, and you'll do yours. And so, to recap this week's episode... We had mysteries as part and parcel of friendship and uh, might include Tony's romantic love. Or certainly includes awkwardness between father and son, uh, deep lakes, stone circles, a good night's sleep in a moment, a flight through regions and without reason. And Am I right that this is the first time that you actually move out of the center of the screen uh, as a playable character, right? Because you sort of swoop up and down through the clouds. Doesn't it move out of the center? Um, whereas if you are normally playing the game, it's actually everything else that moves around you. And your character stays right in the middle of the TV screen. Anyway, it certainly will be the case next week once you meet up with Ness and Paula and you take your place third in the line. Um, next week we'll follow our trio uh, along the path that was previously blocked up to Saturn Valley and Grapefruit Falls. Until then, take care. podcast you just heard was recorded with Anchor. If you want to make your own, download the Android or iOS app completely free from anchor.fm slash podcast. That's anchor.fm slash podcast.